I'm, uh, I'm going to speak slowly so that you can understand my bad Australian accent because I'm not from there. I did that. I did that introduction for seven years. I used to lead the biggest bike shop ride in Austin, Texas, and that was it. Stand up on steps on a wall and say good morning. So. I don't know if I'm on the agenda for the entertainment <laughs> or not, um, but what this won't be is a, a buzzword bingo competition about all the latest trends and directions. <laughs> I know nothing about Bitcoin. I think what I do know is that I'm a no-coiner. That's about the extent of my... Uh, my speciality. Um, I almost know nothing about VM anymore. Um, yeah, almost nothing. I, I enjoyed your presentation, Jacob, because it told me that I knew nothing, <laughs> even though I knew I knew nothing. Um, so I'm Mark Cathcart. I, uh, I left IBM after 23 years in 2009. I was uh, an IBM Distinguished Engineer and a member of the IBM Academy of Technology. But for the most part, I'm a hacker in the traditional sense of the word. In that there are very few applications or programs that I ever wrote from scratch. Um, I always took other people's work and adapted it. I watched trends and directions, and just like I got excited when I heard uh, Jacob talk about adjunct virtual machines, I somehow have this innate ability to apply a technology to see that something actually could be really good used in a specific way. So. That's really what happened to, to me. Um, when I was 13, I won a photography competition. And between 13 and 15, I did no studying at all. Um, I was offered a job by our local newspaper. Um, for those of you under 50, they were big printed tones <laughs> of uh, information. And they were great, um, and they were, you know, they were Facebook for the times. And I, I spend a lot of my time now doing research for music. Um, some of it paid, but most of it just for the love of it, um, and, and mostly jazz music. And it's amazing. They used to print people's names and addresses in articles. I've recently spent um, some time at the Eastman Museum in Rochester, and I just came from the Rock and Roll Archive in Cleveland, and it was like, you could put up people's feet, read the article, and at the bottom it would say, Pete Turner, Pete Turner, one of the greatest color photographers from Rochester, New York, one of the greatest color photographers from our time, and it would say, Pete Turner, Pete lives at 130 Vanberg Avenue in Rochester. <laughs> so, <laughs> privacy isn't just something we've exposed through technology, it, they used to just print it in the newspapers. So, I left school, um, all I had to do was get two qualifications. In the UK, you don't graduate, you take specific exams, still. All I had to do was get English language, so I had to pass English language, and then I had to have one other. They were the minimum requirements for the National Union of Journalists. To work at the newspaper, you had to be a union member. And the union had standards. And I qualified. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent, I spent my first six weeks from high school uh, in, a, in a dark room, in a basement, like 48 hours a week. In, in darkness or red lights, 
printing other people's pictures. Also in those days, you could write a letter into the newspaper, enclose a check, and they would send you, without regard to copyright, the pictures. So you could write in and say, I'd like a picture of this person or this person. They didn't care whose picture it was, who took it. So when you hear the companies talk about copyright today, it's no worse stealing stuff off of Google Images than it used to be in the old days. It's just in the old days you had to write a letter and a check. But after, uh, after about six weeks of this, I hated it. I, like, I would go in, I'd be in the dark all day, I smelled chemicals, it actually destroyed my fingernails. I got like a chemical in the roots of my fingernails. And one of the girls I've been at high school with, was, um, was at, uh, up the street in a recruitment agency as the front desk person. And we met for lunch one day and she said, I could get you a job. And that same woman twice told me that and it changed my life fundamentally. I ended up uh, uh, going as a job for a, an interview for a computer analyst. My dad was furious. I had a proper apprenticeship as a photographer with a future. Who thinks photographers have a future? <laughs> my, but my dad, my dad, I don't think he forgave me until I got elected to the IBM Academy of Technology almost 30 years later. So I went to work as a um, as a, a computer panel selector, and I'm going to talk about a lot of things about me, right? And when I left IBM in 2009, I kind of skunk out of the back door, having handed over my laptop and um, my laptop and badge in a place that I knew almost no one. So I'm gonna try and treat this as my farewell to IBM. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about me and my mistakes and things that I learned and things that I did. I'm going to make some claims about what I did, but they're literally just what I did. They don't mean I did them. They're things that I did, but I did them off the back of a huge number of people. And I'm delighted that you know a lot of them are here. One guy um, is even going to appear on the slides um, as shown up. Today. So, you know, most of my work I did off the shoulders of other people. Um, I doubt almost anyone in here except for maybe Romney um, will know most of these people. Um, Adrian Walmsley was the senior VM guy for many years at IBM UK. Adrian was just so nice to me when I first went to the UK VM users group and so supportive and helpful. And then 10 years later, Adrian was responsible for hiring me into IBM UK as the only systems engineer that year. As the economy crashed, Adrian got me in. And I'll talk about why and how we set about doing some of the year 2000 stuff at IBM UK. Stuart McRae, um, Stuart, I owe all. What did I do? I never changed anything. Is it just Stuart's name? <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a 5G tag or something? Um, Stuart McRae is responsible for my programming experience. Stuart was at Imperial College and part of the UK VM user group when I first met him. Stuart gave me the source code for a Pascal compiler that ran on CMS. Until then, I'd only been exposed to COBOL, and it was only other people's COBOL programs. So Stuart was responsible for giving me the tools through source code to allow me to actually learn to program. And I still have the source code that wants a, a, a VM370 release 3 capable Pascal compiler. 
Um, Mike Callishaw, you should all know, at least by name, I'm, you know, disappointed Mike couldn't be here. Mike, again, another legend, um, you know, it just, you know, it was just, it was a phenomenal lesson for me to learn how to apply ideas to technology. Mike would, you know, Mike would do things, he would see things, and then set about actually doing it. John Hartman, CMS Pipelines. John, uh, John and I shared so many trips. John worked in Denmark at the distribution center in Sindelfingen. Uh, John and I shared both European shared user group meetings together, but we also spent a huge amount of time at customers. And John was another so innovative. You know, we fixed CMS with some John Hartman hacks. Uh, we fixed CMS to run way above 16 meg long before, um, long before the XA product, so that we could support 23,000 users at ICI in uh, Withenshaw, near Liverpool, in the northeast before ICI split into, you know, chemicals and pharmaceuticals and just again just brilliant and so lots of other people Newsom, Dick Newsom, if you don't know was the manager of one of the of IBM Kingston during the original um, explosion I think is possibly the right word um, of VM as a guest system Dick uh, brought me up to Kingston twice I spent um, the summers of 84 and 85, working with the guys in Kingston on guest support. Melinda Varian, uh, you know, Melinda was a constant source of reminder that if you think you're going to get something real bad, that's how you'll get it. She used to say the converse of that, but it was great. Hank Key, I worked with Hank, he's still on the radio, for God's sake. You know, I thought he was old when I worked with him in 1983 and 4. We worked on the world's first home banking system together. And Hank, I learned a lot from as well. Nick D'Onofrio, you always need a mentor. I don't care how senior you are, how old you are. A good mentor will open doors and close them for you faster than you could ever know. So D'Onofrio, and then Jerry Hackett, who some of you will have worked for. Um, Jerry and I, um, I, I used to turn transparency slides for Jerry when she came to speak at Share Europe and do the opening presentations about the latest releases. She, did the, she would do a combination of the Tina pitches and the Jacob pitches, lists of bullets. And I used to turn the slides. I would sit on stage and she would say, next slide, and I would do this. And Jerry ended up, at least in so much as I can remember, as the VP of software development at Dell and nearly 40, 35 years later, I ended up as her chief software architect. So I'm gonna tell you a lot of things. I don't mean to imply I was responsible they were things that I took and championed, but there were always, always other people doing them, supporting them, and so on. So before, um, before I started at IBM, I, I literally got hired as a computer panel server. What I later learned was that I was a relational database. <laughs> I, no, literally. I was in a room, closed door, the data was on boxes of cards, on shelves, which are rows, and the data was organized within the cards as columns. And someone would come up to a hatch in the room, in the door, and they would hand me a sheet, and it would say, we want all the 25 year old women over 25 that smoked and you know various other combinations but that was one that always stuck with me because as we later learned uh, 
from that company, well not from that company, but from what they were doing, that really, even earlier, they knew that a certain type of women were prone to getting cancer. And, and they knew them, they were sending them questionnaires. This was 1974, 74, 75. They already knew by then. So we used to do that. It was a market research company. They would be commissioned, and I would get these things, and you literally would then sort boxes, thousands of cards through a card sorter, and then you would take the results set down to the computer room, wrap some JCL around it, and what did it do? It printed out address labels. So card sorting was a lot of fun, but I didn't last long card sorting um, because what happened was the card sorting and the printing labels used to be done overnight. So I would be on night shift, and the other thing we used to do on night shift was compilations. It was common in those days to wait three days to get your program combined. Right? It, I, this picture, top left, is me on a 360-40. This went out on a state-of-the-art marketing brochure. I just point out, you can't quite see it here, but I have a pair of Dr. Martins on. I know there's always a fashion icon. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pair of Dr. Martins, Prince of Wales check, and a big beard. I was 17 by then, I guess, probably 16. Um, so what happened was the programmers would wait up. I would call them, telephone them, and say, I'm going to do your compilation now, and on night shift, and I would run the compilation, and if it didn't get a return code zero, I would phone them back. We would talk through the cards and you know, I'd fix the programs and recompile them, and that's how I learned to program. So it was astonishing. Um, I stayed there for about a year and a half, and then I went to work for PO Computer Services, which was the shipping line. They had a, they'd just started a separate computer system, computer bureau, and one of the big things there was they ran VM 370, 1975. And the biggest thing, responsible, so they ran payroll, they ran shipping tickets. So if you went on a cruise, you got a punch card. I mean, literally, your ticket for the cruise ship was a punch card. Um, and they did a bunch of other, you know, kind of in-house um, applications for the shipping line. But the number one CPU consuming application for their first three months as a separate computer business was the adventure game, <laughs> played by the computer operators. I have never played another computer game since then. We used to stay after shifts, so it was the, the operations team was three shifts, finished at 2.30, the evening shift would come in, the evening shift would finish at 11.30, then the night shift would come in. The only shift we never stayed was when you were on the night shift into the day shift, because office was full of people. <laughs> Whereas in the afternoon and in the evening overnight, we would actually have line flow maps of how to navigate round adventure <laughs> taped up. You know, like we would get out the shift, you'd go get the box with the evening shift adventure maps. And the systems programmer was John Coe. Uh, and John um, was told by the management after the three months that the adventure game had to go. <laughs> I was like, because it was skewing all the numbers. So it disappeared, we couldn't find it. And um, I was up for a promotion to senior operator. Bear in mind, I was 17. I was surprised when the guy didn't get the promotion. And the manager, um, I can't remember his first name now, but his surname was Morris. So he was, I think he was Bill or John Morris. Anyway, he, uh, he made some snarky remark, like you do to a cocky 17-year-old, about not getting the promotion. He said, you don't have the skills for it. It was a damn computer room job. 
We used to turn the lights off and take 600 foot tape reels and have wars in there at night with the plastic tops of the tape reels. What skills did you need? Until one guy got his ear cut and had to go to hospital. His ear cut, like the edges of those, the edges of those 600 feet tapes were sharp. So um, Morris, this guy Morris, um, made this witty comeback to me. And uh, I decided, hey, I'm going to prove to you that I'm smarter than you think. And so a couple of weeks later, uh, I, we used to have an overnight delivery driver that would bring data tapes, different um, key punch stuff from the office in central London out to Ripley'sworth. And uh, he would take the backup tapes back. So you know where this is going. One day he didn't turn up. I took the company van, even though I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> I took the company van, I took the backup tapes into London, put them in the secure room, and took the backup tapes out from a month earlier, which I knew would have adventure on it. <laughs> and surely, yes, there was no security on the tapes in those days. They were in. Wouldn't have been, been, I guess that would have been in CMS dump format. Well, it wasn't even VMF PLC2, I don't even remember that. Um, and I duly put it back, and this guy, Morris, uh, gave me a hard time over it. He said, Look, you've got to stop this, it's not allowed. I said to him, You have no idea where this is going to end. And a month later, I took a new job at Bovis Home Construction where they had a paper tape reader. And uh, my parting shot was to leave my manager, Morris, his salary <laughs> in a sealed envelope on his desk. Because, of course, the payroll tapes were in the same safe. <laughs> and all he needed was the tape. You just dump the tape out. And, you know, you could work out the format, and that was that. And uh, they never let me back in the building. <laughs> there were a lot of those in my career. Um, the middle one, the middle one is uh, is me at at, at um, one two five with only thirty two mega. No, but only yeah, it was actually it was less than I can't remember. But it was like so small. And I heard um, the guy do the introduction this morning and talk about. It going over a gigabyte of memory. I'm like, a gigabyte? <laughs> so that was tiny. And my big thing there was we used the console like Twitter. We would pick up phones. You ready for data? Go to data. And I would be exchanging messages with, uh, with the operators, except instead of like Twitter, they were 128 characters. You could get 128 characters in a single console message, backwards and forwards. And then on the left is me at Canada Life Insurance in 1979. Canada Life gave me my big break to be a system junior trainee, something like that, system programmer. And that was my, intro, my real introduction to VM. I installed VM370 release 6 on a uh, 4331. And another, another great example that came from that of source code was we had diskette machines. We had some remote offices. They would send the data to us for processing in VS1 by remote diskettes, 3741s. You could do copy a diskette from Dublin in Ireland onto your local 3741. But we couldn't get the damn thing to work under VM. Once we put VS1 under VM, we couldn't get it to work. The local, um, local IBM systems engineer got the source code, came in one day, and we sat and went through the source code and we extended. It needed an extra two character extension to the record side to allow the diskettes to be 128 byte records and then to have a couple of bytes 
in the communication for um, checking the data, for validating the data. So again, by this time, I'm like totally convinced about source code. Um, I worked on a TRS-80 project, a remote TRS-80 dial-up off the back of that diskette project. My boss, uh, Jim Nellums, wrote it up for the British Computer Society. It got published, got picked up in New York, and the, remember the girl that I was at high school with who worked in the front desk at the recruitment agency? It's like a small world. She phoned up one day, she was now a recruiter, and they'd been approached to hire me to go work on Um, so she'd been, she'd been hired, her company had been hired to recruit me and a couple of other people um, to go work on the world's first home banking system in New York. But I really, so I went for this interview in, in a hotel in Kensington, um, in London, and there were these, um, there were these um, three, two vice presidents and one senior vice president, and all I did was talk about the year. I'm like so excited about the year. And they were like kind of confused. And I asked them what they got that was running the year. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so I talked about the They had an eight megabyte 4341 running their credit card authorization application. And I said to them, hey, look, give me 12 meg. I could, oh, and they had a Fortran um, fraud analysis application that was running in a computer bureau. And I said, look, upgrade the 4341 to 12 meg, and I'll run that in-house. I'll, I'll bring it in-house. And lo and behold, we did it. Um, they hired me at five times my salary. I had a loft apartment. First arrived at a loft apartment in Greenwich Village. Trust me, back in those days, you needed at least eight times your salary. <laughs> I worked on a deficit for, uh, for three years in New York, losing money. I kept getting awards and money because that was how they could make it up. And, um, and I still lost money. I was like, hand over, was like, get money, get award, spend it. But I spent a lot of my time at user groups. I had some absolutely brilliant presentations at Share, including the very first one, which was um, which we had to cut the prices off the slides for a comparison of, um, uh, of um, online for monitoring, performance monitoring, Rich Greenberg, I don't know if it's Rich, Rich and I frantically up at the front cutting holes in the slides to remove the prices. Um, you can't see this, but I also spent time um, on the Wolf of Wall Street's boat. Any of you that don't think that life is a setup and a misunderstanding, as Reagan started to um, bust open interstate commerce and interstate banking, the New York banks all got together, they divided up the country, decided who was going to buy what, and agreed, and that was that. And I, you know, by that time, um, had done a lot of guest support, so I was there with a senior vice president. He would come out and say, I've got this, can we run that under me? And I would just say yes. <laughs> like, I mean, I didn't care, because there was so much money, you knew you could fix it. Um, so that was the top left. I don't know why this isn't working, but never mind. Um, we did say so we did some fun things. PC XT 370, the PC AT 370. Um, some fun things that I don't. As much as at the time I desperately wanted IBM to make a big deal out of, um, they didn't. But in hindsight, I don't. No one's going to have that money in the year instead of us on a PC. 
Um, one of the pictures on the top left is, uh, or what would have been on the top left, is um, the, the first big project that I ran at Chemical Bank in New York City. Again, those of you that have just seen C16 would have no concept of the size of a 3033 MP. The bank had one sitting around that had, re that had replaced its, uh, that had replaced, um, been replaced by a 3081 or 3084. And, um, do you think it's worth? Is it? Yeah, so this top left, this is us in the machine room on a 3033. Um, we literally tried to run the Swift banking application from a VSE system under VM on a 3033 MP. The first time we, we IPL, this would have been 80, late 83, the first time we IPL VM on a 3033 MP, it never appeared on the console. We spent ages instruction stepping it through the IPL. And then realized what was actually happening is you would IPL on this console, you would IPL on this console, and the messages would come up on the console in the tape library. <laughs> These were ident two, like basically a single core on each side of the computer. Each side of the computer was identically configured for IR. So it randomly you would get dispatched on processor two. And processor two would talk to device whatever number, and that might not be the same one. <laughs> you know, it was just so when we started to run VSE under it, the whole idea of reserve release wasn't well documented. This was so this is three seventy. It wasn't well documented, and we went live twice, and it completely failed. It ran. We'd done the testing. It worked perfectly in test. We ran it. it ran till like 2.30 in the morning, and then it would fail. And we just couldn't work it out. And we had all these people down from Endicott and Kingston, all the IO specialists, I'm just looking around for Bob Rogers. Bob's here this week, I saw him this morning. Bob um, certainly would know a lot of those people. They came down, and we eventually figured out that what was happening is CP was changing a lot of the reserve releases, even though the devices were dedicated. Because of the CCWs that were being used, it was changing into senses. So they weren't getting reserved, at which point they would get, the, the, something would run on the other side, which would lock out, and so the thing just hung. And I went to the World Trade Center on December the 12th, 1983, for the annual Christmas party, the senior vice president that hired me um, shook my hand as I went in and he said, uh, how's it going to go tonight? I'm like, it's going to be fine. He said, you know, if it's not, if it doesn't work, we're not going to let you back in the country. I said, <laughs> I said, because I was going back to the UK for Christmas the next day. And I said, you know, if it doesn't work, I'm not coming back. <laughs> um, and it worked. And a few years later, after doing, we did loads of MVS under VM. I went up to Kingston. We actually created two specific modes, which I don't even know if they still exist, to run chemical banks MVS work under VM. Um, and my towards the end, I was promoted to an assistant treasurer at the bank. And, and by this time, it, I was 25. I was the youngest, at that time, the youngest assistant treasurer in the bank. So it was good fun. This is me at the lunch, I think, um, from that. So that was really our experience running Swift. We, uh, we really didn't know what we didn't know. And I found through my career that is often the biggest problem, is that we just didn't know was going to happen. So we tested, we tested, and it still went wrong. Um, then the bank, so by this time I was working out at Chemical Bank in Jericho on Long Island, and um, we'd done some really, the uh, home banking system, Pronto had started, we did some really innovative stuff with that. 
I have a slide on next just briefly. But then the next challenge came was running a 3084 with these ideas that we developed with IBM Kingston, which is, do um, you have non-destructive translation mode still in VM? I don't even know that it was in uh, XA, it never even made it to XA, but under VMHPO, you could take an identically configured four core, four core processor, and you could set up a VM guest which would boot on, which would be in the VM directory, and VM wouldn't know about any of the devices on the other half of the system. And over there, you could boot MVS, IPL, <laughs> you can IPL MVS on this one. My X-Edit macro had failed to take into account a non-zero return code. And so it would just drop through, go back to the top, and literally one X edit macro running in a virtual machine, disconnected virtual machine, would hang MVS, running a full blown production credit card authorization application. I could not find the photo, but I've got a picture of us. Jeff Jaminder, who was on the earlier slide, is here with me. Was my, Jeff is my, was my BSE guy and works at Broadcom now. I was amazing when I got in touch with him from LinkedIn and said, do you remember what happened? <laughs> and um, there's a picture of us with me sitting on the hardware console in 3018, trying to work out what the hell was going on. And literally, someone suggested, I don't think it was me, but it wouldn't have been out of character, but maybe we lost a bit in the Todd clock. <laughs> so that every hour it would roll over and then just fall off the air or something. It was just the wild times. The, the most, I think, the most important thing though, that I learned uh, at my time at Chemical Bank was in with Hank Keys and the team. So those of you that don't know or have never come across Hank Key, he, in the very first year, the PC Tech Journal awarded a gold medal to Bill Gates and Philippe Kahn, who was the Borland guy, founder, Hank Key also got a, a gold medal. Hank was the guy that set up the PC uh, bulletin board, SIG Blue system for the New York Amateur Computer Club. And when we were doing a lot of the work around integrating the really early personal computers in with the mainframe uh, and doing some of that work, one of the guys had this on the outside of his cubicle. And this for me was like a massive waking. It was from 1982, it says, it's easy for those of us that have been exposed to the capabilities of microprocessors to flamboyantly proclaim the death of the money right? 1982, and he said, it's not going to happen. Uh, what will happen is that interfaces to those of the buyer's bonds will become friendlier. And this was the second big thing in my career. You know, interfaces, or as we now call them, APIs, APIs are everything, right? With a good set of APIs, carefully thought through, well structured, you can make anything do anything. Right? As long as the API does it, you can do it. And I use this from then on, um, and you'll see. Um, and the thing that I learned about IBM was to be the change that I wanted to see. This isn't my saying, I don't remember, it's probably someone saying it much more, uh, much more intelligent than I am. But what I learned at IBM was to be the change that I wanted. I got hired to do the L partner introduction in the UK for the banks, all the big banks. That was my, that was my remit, based off of the work that I'd done at Chemical Bank, Newsom and a bunch of the IBM people knew Adrian. I knew Adrian from years before. I went back to the UK. I worked for a small company in London called IFR Publishing. We set up an X25 network for worldwide financial data. It's just like, it was one of the worst ideas that IBM ever sold when I thought 381. I sued IBM because I was the data processing manager. 
I said to IBM, they then said for the upgrade, we released the upgrade, and then downsized everything to a deck microbax, based off of the idea that, um, that you could do anything with the APIs. That was my first big test of what you do with APIs. So I got hired to do LPAR, first of all, to get all the big banks running in guest virtual machines, then to introduce uh, multiple high performance guests. Do we still have that? Probably not. Under VMSA or ZDM, probably not. But, you know, in the old days, you could only have one V equals R guest, and the rest were all running in virtual memory. And then we have multiples, and psi instruction was in. And, and so that was really, until 92, that was my, my gift. You know, when you see people talk about, you know, the year 2000 and how it wasn't anything, it was because, at least in London, and I know from New York, because I came here a few times to pitch, I even went to Chemical Bank in New Jersey, and one of the systems programmers said, are you the same Mark Capcom that wrote this in Z? And they were still running <laughs> seven years later, they didn't know what it did. Um, but by that time, client server was a big deal. Um, but the other thing that was going on was just like the amount of constant change. It's really hard to explain. The constant amount of change, like massive change. So we went, you know, we went from doing VMXA um, and LPARs at, uh, for Y2K testing. Texaco had a VMXA ESP system they were trying to run profs on. Again, in data privacy terms, we were nowhere back then. If you didn't have access to the computer room, it was secure. So the prof system from Texaco, the oil company in London, we put on 3480 tapes, including all the user data, literally the whole system. We took it to Poughkeepsie, to the ITSC, the system center in Poughkeepsie, and uh, we recreated their system people from um, profs development and people from VMXA development working on it for three weeks before we could get it to work the way they wanted. But the amazing thing now is we just literally took everything, all the data, all the user data, all the emails, everything. So times change. Um, and I, I, I mentioned the ICI pharmaceuticals thing. That was 23,000 prof users by 19, that would have been sort of 93, I think. Part of actually getting all that code to support, to work, was this new VM service tool. Melinda and the Sage, I can see RT after that, and all the Sage VM users had been railing against IBM's withdrawal of source code for years. I was understood the importance of source code, but you know, kind of like I was on this API kit. As long as there was an API, I didn't need the source code. Right? If the API did what it did, was supposed to do, didn't need the source code. And um, it turns out that we got all the PTFs for VM. A lot of them were in CP. We got some firmware updates, and we are teaching the class at the International Education Centre in Brussels for the European field engineers on running multiple high performance guests on the VM. And we couldn't get the service supply. It would not work. So it was a four day weekend. The class was due to start like we have not We've got lots of four day weekends. Um, you know, we get paid for the Monday and Friday as well. It's not just a four day weekend. Um, the class was due to start on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. I'm like, I can fix this. I'll fix the service process. So we literally, me and a guy called Paul McKee, who was an instructor over there, um, we literally set the machine up. We did a snapshot copy using old school DDR techniques of the machine. We would try to do the service and then just restore the damn thing, go for coffee, go for lunch come back, the restore it finished, we'll try again. We were literally hacking our way through the VM says exec one go at a time. And I'm delighted to say that we actually did manage to get the service applied 
And in the process, again, like in my old days with adventure, we had literally maps using whiteboard flip charts, maps taped around all the windows of the classroom showing where the code went. You know, like, do this with this set of characters, and it does this, which goes to slide 56, or you know, page 56, which is over there. And we literally did it all. The next couple of months, I wrote it down in a book, and I am delighted to say it was the first ever IBM Red Book we shipped with a disk yet. Just, so, <laughs> just so we're clear, this was a major breakthrough. And it was in a period where we weren't allowed to have our names published in Red Books. So if you want to get a hold of this book from the software manuals places, you can spot my kids' birthday sitting in there. <laughs> They're all in there. Um, and then I went to present it in New Orleans at a share session, and I figured instead of handouts, I just ordered 400 copies of the book. They showed up, I had them shipped to the hotel. There were people out the corridors for this session. It is mind-boggling now to think that that many people were charged. It's like it's way over 200 people showed up to hear a VM session about service to and if you'd have asked me last week who of the two guys from Kingston did the original says work, I would never remember their name, but the mind works in a funny way. Al Coco and Bill Newsom. I can't remember, but at the, as a community, we, and I was working for IBM, we were horrible to those guys. And it was totally unjustified. Well, because I I spent some time building Newman? Newman. Newman, that was it. Thank you, John. Bill Newman. We were horrible to those guys. I mean, and they were just programmers that had been yanked out of the SMP service group and told to write a service tool for VM because the VM people wouldn't accept SMP. And we were literally horrible. It's one of the few things in my life that I'm ashamed of. I mean, I tried to work with them, but they just wouldn't, they couldn't deviate from what they've been told to do. That was their mission. In a big company, you either quit or you do what you're told, right? Or you slowly be the change you want to see. And so that's what happened. The service tool that you have now, which I assume still bears some lineage to Jacob mentioned it, DM says is you know the change that we wanted to see. I don't know if you get all the source code or things like VMF, VM, LDF. I've forgotten even the names of it now. But that was the point, was to be the um, <laughs> yeah, one of the best session awards. It's still mind-boggling, really. But I could stand up and ramble about a service tool and win the best session award. Um, I went back to the UK, I was working at IBM UK, I did loads of different things. Um, but this idea that an API is all you need was the thing that um, was the thing that stuck with me for so long. Um, in, a, in sort of 94-ish, my boss then, um, who Eric, Eric is here, Eric Hammond from IBM, formerly from IBM Germany, um, know my boss then. And we were given this project, they called it Pandora. They put six of us on it and told us they didn't care what we did. But you've got to rescue the mainframe. It was going through such a bad publicity thing. So we were like, yay, we had money. We had, there was like four of us were technical people and two of us, or two of the guys were for marketing. And we just had so much fun for two years. Um, we did the original OS, <coughs> I can't even remember what it was now, MBS bonus pack, was that it, Jim? The bonus pack. So when the web server first got ported to MBS and then VM, with this thing called a bonus pack, we actually shipped a box with little mini manuals and CDs and, and a fully working web server. And if I remember, didn't we do, lucky, for about a year, we offered a million dollars to anyone that could break into a mainframe that was on the internet? Never got broken into. 
I mean, it wouldn't last a day now, <laughs> the old code that we had back then. I'm not saying it didn't last with the code you could put up now, but with the old code, it was, it was just like amazing times. And then we started to push for open standards, massive deal. Got to do open standards. Um, Mike Howershaw, who was on my slide earlier, had got this thing called the Oak, uh, which he got from Sun Microsystems, which was Java. And so I worked with Mike and the guys at IBM Hersley, and for uh, WW5, I think it was in 1996, for the World Wide Web Conference in 1996, we did a demo for the first time anywhere of Java running on MVS. It was on MVS. Um, Java running on MVS um, attached to CICS. So you could actually use a Java client, an app, what do we call them, applets? I can't remember what we call them, but you could use an applet to talk to Java on the mainframe, which would then invoke a Kinks transaction. And we actually sold that before Java was widely known. We actually had that as a working solution at two banks, as a sold solution. And then the following year, I had to learn how to teach Java programming. I don't write any of this shit, but you know, I could learn enough to actually teach people how to do it. And that led to DCE, POSIX, CORBA. Of course, as I said earlier, I wasn't the only I'm not saying I did this. But by this time, I had the ear of all the important people I and your reputation is only as good as your last mistake. <laughs> so, you know, I was lucky for a while. Jim Perel that's here was in, in 390 Strategy. Uh, I worked with them a lot and we did the Corba stuff, you know, which was a good idea, but didn't really go anywhere, mostly in IBM because of the demise of the system object model. But, but the Corba stuff really gave us a different perspective, again, on the idea of you just need an API. If you've got an API, you can do things with it. And, and then there was Open Edition and um, Linux. Um, Linux was a big deal as part of this. And, 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 and by this time, I was literally working with Sam Parmazano, who was the head of systems group. Who was, um, who was deigned to take over as CEO and president of IBM. And um, Gerstner had been in for, I don't know, a number of years by then. Um, and, you know, getting Linux, getting the money for Linux, was a lot more important than getting the technology for Linux. How was my wine session? Have I got an hour? Two minutes, yeah, I'm way over. I'll, um, <laughs> I'll put this in there and get it to start. In case you're wondering, this is me. I'm 40 pounds heavier than I've been for the last 20 years. I was 40 pounds heavier than that. Yeah. I'd like to show you why what you see on an idea of land today may not change, but the way that you view it will. Most business managers today want to preserve technology investments and to address new business opportunities. What is needed are solutions for total system integration that makes resources of the IBM mainframe and line systems available to anyone in the country. So, there we were. I'll put this whole video up. It is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it took us eight hours to film. I thought I was going to show up. There was going to be a professional crew there. We were going to do a video. I was going to speak right now, and that would be fine. Three hours later, I would finish. Eight hours sitting on this thing that sloped like this 
my nuts went to numb. <laughs> it was horrendous. We had to script the whole thing because the producers were to be able to cut when I made verbal or physical mistakes. They might be able to cut me. It took us eight hours doing this. It was just the worst thing in my life. But what we basically got to by the early 2000s, I think it was 2002, we went, all the IBM, well not all the IBM companies, but most of the IBM companies, a few selected IBM distinguished engineers, and all of the senior executive staff for Gerstner and for San Palmazano went to uh, MIT for two weeks in the summer to work on the strategy. What was Sam Palmazano's strategy as CEO of Winfrey? And for me, I think it was the least technical year of my life, but it was the most impressive. I think we actually got the CEO of IBM to commit to a bunch of things, one of which was Linux. Well, you know, Parmesano had been on Linux for a while. Um, I have a slide after this. This is really going to be my last slide. I have a slide after this, which I have some links. I'll put things up. Um, the product name was so terrible, I can't even remember it myself. Oh, yeah, so here it is. The OS390 automated Unix system option for VM, VSE, and OS390. You thought you had some... <laughs> Some bad things. Um, this was an actual product. It's let's take a mainframe and pretend it's Unix. Right? We actually built this as a product. It was always going to be a nightmare. And as part of the sort of build up for this, I went to Berlinger and um, Strassmeyer, is that saying? Carl Heinz, the idea. The, Carl, yes, Carl, Carl Heinz Strassmeyer. Yes, I went to Berlinger and we were working on like kind of the technical messaging. We were doing all this stuff with open edition back then and POSIX and, that. and this thing was going to be sold to universities. It was a mainframe. It was running, it would run any of the guests for their application portfolio, but you would maintain it as a Unix system. It is mind-bogglingly stupid that anyone ever thought that would sell, and it didn't. And, and as, part of the, as part of the process, but it was no point, one of those things. IBM looking for ways to make its software relevant. Right? So, you know, it was good. So part of that, I met uh, this young programmer, he was 23, 24, young guy in the inter, called Boaz Betzler. And Boaz um, told me all about one day in the Birmingham and told me all about shipping the uh, converting the GPL tool set to run on the mainframe. And I'm like, so you can run the GNU C compiler and produce mainframe executables? And he's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, this is it. <laughs> and, and so one of the things that I did, and, and it, it, it's still it's still another remarkable thing that involves a boat on a Sunday afternoon, was I went to Parmesano's um, Parmesano's house in Connecticut on the on the what is this called the Long Island Sound or whatever it is. Um, and we sat on the boat. We talked about what we were going to do to make you know, IBM successful. And my big thing was Linux. We're just going to do Linux. We're going to do Linux. Because if we don't, there are hundreds of thousands of programmers in India and China that will. You can either sit on the back of that work, or you can watch it pass you by. And Parmesano was convinced. I mean, it wasn't quite like that, but there was a lot of work to get to the point where you would get a phone call on a plane going up to New York and say, what are you doing on Sunday? Can you come to this address? Uh, but it really did happen kind of like that. A 
It's like whatever you think, whatever idea that tells you now that they invested in their next thing, it was really one intern in Birmingham doing porting some source code, and then, you know, and a bunch of applications getting running in Linux in a, in a virtual machine, and then a bunch of executives committing to it. It was just a phenomenal time to be involved in. And really, my last big piece at, at IBM was um, working on, the, I think it's the 2002 annual report. And I got to actually write the wording about APIs and the future in the annual report. I think it was by But anyway, it was just an amazing time. And, you know, I am just so grateful for all the people that put up with me as a kid with no computer science education, no programming experience, and help me get some of those things done. It's just fabulous. So I'm done. Um, what I do now is I do jazz music research for biographers. I went after I left IDF in 2009, I went to work at Dell. Chief software architect for a couple of years, and then they hired all the people from IBM Software Group to build the software business. And I left IBM to get away from them. So <laughs> I, I, I left Dell when the chance came up. Um, I will put all these things in a clickable link, and I will also put that video if you've got if you've got insomnia. Uh, if you're an IBM in uh, in one of the IBM education centers was like there used to be a series of those presentations of which mine was one uh, that you could watch in your bedroom. I think these days the internet has introduced a whole new form of pornography. <laughs> 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 Rather than buzzword bingo. So thank you very much. I hope this has been worth your time.